What's up guys? We are here at the Monument of the Battle of the Nations. One of Germany's and the world's biggest monuments. The Monument to the Battle of the Nations or the Volker Schlagdenkmal or Volki is a monument in Leipzig, Germany to commemorate the 1813th Battle of Leipzig. To better understand the monument, let's begin with the events before its construction. Following the French Revolution, France had waged a number of wars against its European neighbors, headed by Napoleon Bonaparte as Emperor of the French under the title Napoleon I since 1804. Over the course of the hostilities, the Holy Roman Empire had ceased to exist following the abdication of Emperor Francis II. Due to Napoleon's pressure, including the foundation of the Confederation of the Rhine, from various former members of the empire. The War of the Fifth Coalition in 1809 had ended with another defeat for the joint forces of the Austrian Empire, Great Britain, Spain, and Portugal against the French and their German allies. Following Napoleon's unsuccessful invasion of Russia in 1812, Prussia joined the countries already at war with France to begin the War of the Sixth Coalition in March 1813. During the early part of the campaign, the Allied forces against Napoleon suffered defeats. However, due to lack of training in his newly recruited soldiers, Napoleon was unable to take full advantage of his victories, allowing his enemies to regroup. Following a ceasefire, Austria rejoined the coalition on August 17th, and the tides of the battle had turned against France. Between October 16 to 19, 1813, the Battle of the Nations outside Leipzig was the decisive one in the war, cementing the French defeat and temporarily ending Napoleon's rule. The Emperor was exiled in Elba in May 1814, but briefly returned to power the following year before being permanently banished following his defeat at the Battle of Waterloo. The Battle of the Nations was fought between France and their German allies against a coalition of Russians, Austrian, Prussian, and Swedish forces. About half a million soldiers were involved and at the end of the battle, around 110,000 men had lost their lives with many more dying in the days after in field hospitals in and around the city. In the immediate aftermath, both the Battle of Leipzig as well as the War of Liberation, as they became known in Germany, soon established a controversial and divided culture of remembrance. For liberal thinkers and young, educated students, many of whom had fought in the wars, they resembled a starting point for a potential German unification into a national state. On the other side, the monarchs of the German states, as well as conservatives highlighted the role of the princes had played in the struggle against Napoleon, seeing a growing desire for a German national state as an attack on their royal and noble positions. Ernest Moritz Ardent, a leading liberal and nationalistic writer called for a commemoration of the battle throughout Germany. The anniversary of October 19th should be marked by festivities with burning fires, festive folk clothing, oak wreaths, and the ringing bells. In fact, the first anniversary of the battle was marked by celebrations across the German countries, including bonfires, while others prohibited the celebration or it was integrated in other festivities around the same time. In Berlin, the capital of the Kingdom of Prussia, the main celebration was organized by the Turner movement, gymnastic clubs led by the nationalist Friedrich Ludwig Jon. However, following the Carlsbad decrees of 1819, nationalistic student groups as well as the Turners were outlawed, and commemoration of the Battle of Leipzig subsided over the following years. In the 1840s, the Association for the Celebration of October 19th was established in Leipzig, 
partly reviving the remembrance of the event. However, only the anniversaries in 1838 and 1863 were forcefully expressed. In 1863, for the battle's 50th anniversary, the city put up large festivities, inviting representatives from 200 German cities and several hundred veterans. The celebrations included nationalistic songs and reading of poems with between 25,000 to 30,000 people in attendance. It was also Moritz Ardent who first proposed to create a large monument on the site of the battle. Shortly after the battle, Arden called for a monument to be built on the site. As quoted, he demanded it has to be constructed in such a way that it can be seen from all the streets around from which the Allied armies moved to the bloody decisive battle. If it is to be seen, it has to be large and splendid, like a colossus, a pyramid, or the Cologne Cathedral. However, Lack of political will prevented such a monument of being built at the time. As years passed by, other people came forward with plans for a large memorial as well, including Carl Sieking and August von Kotzbe, who suggested a 102 feet tall Roman column with an iron cross on top, symbolizing the victory of the German against France the modern Rome. The architect Friedrich Weinbrenner proposed a fortress to be built outside Leipzig, at the top of which a pyramid was to be placed, with the quadriga that Napoleon had taken from the Brandenburg Gate in Berlin situated on it. While none of the proposals for Leipzig gained any support, a monument for the Wars of Liberation was erected in Berlin in 1821. Designed by Karl Friedrich Schnickel, it was a miniature of a Gothic church tower bearing the names of the 12 battles fought against the French. Its inscription highlighted the role of the monarch over that of the people. Aside from those, Small monuments were already erected since the first anniversary of the battle in 1814. In 1843, a sandstone monument was erected at Napoleon Hill, where the emperor had supposedly watched the battle. Two years later, the local government of Leipzig established another monument, commemorating the entrance of the victorious forces into the city. Until 1863, seven memorial stones were also placed to mark decisive points of the battle, which still remains to this day. In the same year, on the 50th anniversary of the battle, city officials also funded the restoration of the monument they had erected in 1845. During the same festivities, a cornerstone for a future grad monument was placed, and 23 cities from all around Germany including Vienna, Hanover, and Dresden pledged money for its construction. However, the unification of Germany and the subsequent foundation of the German Empire temporarily halted plans for a monument. Since public conscience turned towards the more recent military victories, the commemoration of the Battle of Leipzig as a decisive one in German history was replaced by the Battle of Sedan, and the city of Leipzig erected a monument to the German unification in the city center in 1888. In 1894, Clemens Thieme, a member of the Association for the History of Leipzig, learned during a meeting of the association about the past plans to build a monument. Interested in resuming the project, Clemens, who was also a member of the Apollo Masonic Lodge, proposed the project during a meeting and gained the support of his fellow Masons. Later that same year, he founded the Association for German Patriots, which raised by means of donation and a lottery the funds necessary to construct the monument for the 100th anniversary. The project cost was set at 6 million 
German marks, roughly around 30,400,647 euros in 2022. The following year, the city of Leipzig donated a 40,000 square meters or 9.9 .9 acre site for the construction. Two competitions to find a design were held in 1895 and 1896 and gathered a large number of entries with prizes for the best handed out. However, the association was unhappy with the results on the grounds that they were not innovative enough and none were eventually chosen for the monument. Bruno Schmitz, an architect from Berlin who had won fourth prize in the competition, was ultimately commissioned to submit the final design. The financing, which had originally been thought to rely on donations and a lottery, ran out, leading the city to subsidize the remaining costs. A groundbreaking ceremony was held prior to the start of the construction on October 18, 1898, the 85th anniversary of the battle. A total of 82,000 cubic meters of earth were moved in the following two years until suitable subsoil for the foundation was found. Construction then commenced in mid-September 1900, at which time the original foundation stone from 1863 was moved to the new location. Concrete, a relatively new material at the time, was used for the first time in such a large structure. Proponents in expert literature argued for an iron construction as granting more stability, but the factors of cost and higher creative freedom ultimately led to use of concrete. Work on the foundations alone took five years. In total, 26,500 granite blocks and 120,000 cubic meters of concrete were used for the entire structure. Due to the use of the state-of-the-art machineries, such as traction engines, lifts, a concrete mixer, and a cable railway for transporting gravel. Construction was finished on schedule, in time for the 100th anniversary of the battle in 1913. On October 18, 1913, the Volker Schlack Deckmal was inaugurated in the presence of about 100,000 people, including the Emperor Wilhelm II and all the reigning sovereign rulers of the German states. Now let us talk a little bit about the design of the monument. Schmitz constructed the monument over an artificial hill and selected the pyramid shape for a clear view of the surroundings. The base is 107 feet square. The main structure at 91 meters or 299 feet is as of 2013 still the tallest monument in Europe. Poser places the monument in a line of tradition of similar national monuments of the 19th century. The design is consciously from the style of the Wilhelmine period of the time, as the architects attempted to develop a distinctly German style in architecture and sculpture. Unlike many monuments and buildings of the era, the monument lacks classicist style elements, Instead, borrowing from the architecture of ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt. Clemens, who made frequent adjustments to Schmidt's design, most often due to cutting costs, worked together with the Art Nouveau sculptors Christian Behrens and his apprentice Franz Metzner. Following Behrens' death in 1905, Metzner completed the work, mainly on the sculptures on the inside and top of the monument. At the exterior of the structure, at the front side of the monument, a relief depicts a battle scene. The centerpiece of the relief is a sculpture of the Archangel St. Michael, symbolizing the personification of God's support for the German soldiers. Above Michael, the engraving reads, God mit uns. God with us. On either side of the archangel, furies carry the firebrand of war, while the two eagles symbolize the newly won freedom. So unfortunately, we have the chance to go in and see the interior of the 
On both sides of the relief, lateral staircases lead to the second story and the entrance of the crypt. The staircases are decorated with large heads of Emperor Frederick I, better known as Barbarossa. At the top of the monument, of the outside of the dome roof, stand 12 warrior statues, each composed of 47 granite blocks and 13 meters or 14 yards tall. It is to remind of the Germans that it will defend itself. On the inside, the circle-shaped crypt on the first floor, 16 statues of warriors, symbolically standing guard, two each in front of a total of eight high dead masks. The crypt was meant as a symbolic tomb for the fallen soldiers of the battle. In the Hall of Fame in the second floor, four large sculptures are placed facing each other, which meant to symbolize an alleged virtue of the German people. Bravery, strength, sacrifice, and fertility. Leading towards it, pillared windows are decorated with 96 smaller sculptures representing the suffering in war. The dome itself is filled with 324 almost life-size equestrian statues representing the homecoming of the victors. The dome is about 32 yards in diameter. It creates an unusual acoustics which allowed for concerts to take place within the inner hall. From the crypt, 364 steps lead visitors to the observation platform on top of the monument. As for the surroundings, Schmitz also planned to create a complex for ceremonies that would include a court, a stadium, and parade grounds. However, only a reflecting full and two processional avenues were ultimately completed. Surrounding the monument are oaks, considered to have been a symbol of masculine strength and are complemented by evergreens, symbolizing feminine fertility. And they are located in subordinate position to the oaks. During the 1930s, after the ascension to power of Adolf Hitler, the monument was a frequent meeting ground for Nazi party rallies. During World War II, an anti-aircraft gun position was established on top of the monument. When the U.S. Army captured Leipzig on October 18, 1945, the monument was the last stronghold in the city to surrender. 300 soldiers were holding out in the monument. But after a direct artillery hit inside the structure, they were convinced to surrender following long negotiations. During the period of communist rule in East Germany from 1949 to 89, the government of the GDR was unsure whether it should allow the monument to stand. Since it was considered to represent the steadfast nationalism of the period of the German Empire, Eventually, it was decided that the monument be allowed to remain since it represented a battle in which Russian and German soldiers had fought together against a common enemy and was therefore representative of the Russo-German Brotherhood in arms, although some Germans fought for the French side in the battle. The monument is not without its own problems because shortly after its completion, it became apparent that the water penetrating through the joints between the natural stone, aslars, and concrete core was a problem. Some stone pieces were moved significantly by ice and frost, while water entered a core with no way to escape. Since dampening technology was not available for decades after the construction had finished, as an effect, stairs and pathways became crooked. Moreover, shelling by U.S. troops at the end of the war had left damages to the rear side of the monument. In addition, the effects of nature and pollution had blackened the outside of the structure significantly. Until the 1990s, no considerable efforts had been made to renovate the monument. Until 2003, when such a measure was ultimately began, with the target end of 2013, the 200th anniversary of the battle, 
for their completion, the black discoloring of the facade was gradually removed. The pavement in front of the monument was redone, while a large shell hole dating from World War II was patched up. Not all damages of war were removed however, deliberately leaving open some signs of bullets or shell splinters as a reminder. A new drainage system was also added to the structure to safeguard the building from damage through water. Today, the Monument to the Battle of the Nations stands outside of Leipzig. Its unique architecture and the war it commemorates remind the Germans of their ability to unite in the face of danger. And at the same time, the monument managed to survive the communist years to, to teach the future generations of their heritage and the value of lives lost during the wars. Guys, I hope you enjoy our small tour of the Battle of the Nations. Until next time, bye! So guys, if you like our videos, please subscribe to our channel and feel free to comment. Hit the bell, hit the bell, hit the bell, hit the bell, come on guys, hit the bell! For notifications! And don't forget to share! Hello!